Coach Mary White is back in the house. It's been a long time, so I'm, I'm glad she's back with us. Hey, I want to welcome y'all today, and especially to those of, uh, uh, who are with us uh, on our YouTube channel. And I don't know if uh, I need to do this or not to those of you who are with us online right now, but I want to issue an invitation for you to come join us. If you have been waiting for that, if you've been wondering if it's time, or if you've been wondering if you can, uh, the answer to that is yes. And if we are full in here and you get here, I can move some deacons out of here. <laughs> and I can move them next door, and they can go to our overflow so that you can join us. And I don't think they would mind if that were the case. So, but I did want to welcome you and say you're welcome to come back at any point in time that you are ready. Hey, I, you know, you never know if things are going to work out or not, right? Depending on things that you do. So I'm not sure yet that this whole preaching thing is going to work out for me with y'all. Uh, and just in case, you know, I'm trying to keep my options open. So this weekend I took a gig, my first gig as, my, as, as an assistant DJ at a wedding. That's right. My son was the official DJ and I was the assistant. I'm not so sure it worked out, though, because after I, I was used for all the heavy lifting and all the moving, going inside and going outside for a wedding, getting all soaking wet, sweaty, and all that, and about halfway through the entire event, my dad looked at me, because he was there at the event, and he looked at me and says, I think you lost your job. I said, yeah, I think I have, because my son-in-law got in on me, and he started participating a little bit more, so I'm hoping that the preaching thing works out, Ricky, because my assistant DJ gig just didn't seem to pan out as much as I thought it would uh, for our family wedding this weekend. But, uh, hey, i got to tell you this, too. This is funny. My daughter and I had what we call a deep belly laugh. Y'all know what I'm talking about? Okay, you need several deep belly laughs a day, right? If you don't get them, you're not going to be the same. And so, I kid you not, we get to the part of the wedding, and they're tossing the bouquet and getting ready to throw the garter. Y'all know where I'm at? Y'all, okay, you're with me on this. Well, my niece throws the bouquet, and all that goes. And well, then they get my niece up there, and they sit her in her chair for the garter. And her husband comes up beside her, and they tell him, it's time to throw the garter. And I cannot make this stuff up. He said, where's the garter? <laughs> oh, man, my daughter and I, we, I just thought we were going to die right there. And so, anyway, I think he found it. So, anyway, a little help, a little instruction, but uh, it and innocence, great. So, uh, anyway, enough of that. Let's go to the Bible. Go to Matthew chapter 5, if you will. We're going to get there in just a moment. If you are not a part of one of our discipleship groups, I invite you to participate if you would like. We have one meeting here at the sanctuary tonight at 6 o'clock. And then we will have several in homes all around. The one at uh, Tammy and J.B. Shelley's house will not be meeting tonight. Uh, Tammy has given me permission to share with you that J.B. is in the hospital, in case you did not know this. And so uh, they uh, are observing him for different things, but uh, uh, Alan has been by there last night and this morning on, on our behalf as a church, and uh, we assure you he is doing well, but uh, because of that and because of uh, the circumstances there, I believe we're going to ask the, the Shelley group that meets at that house, if you don't mind coming here uh, this evening uh, to join those who are in the sanctuary. But if you're not a part of one of those, and you would like to sign up, I'm sure Stephen Parker can tell you some more at the end of the service tonight, uh, this morning on that, about what goes on tonight. Uh, but I invite you to do that because we started last week with our discipleship groups and we started with a series of messages on the Sermon on the Mount, which is Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7. And also, if you're a part of our discipleship groups, you, you know that we've begun to start to read through the New Testament uh, in 90 days, okay? And so hopefully you're enjoying reading through the book of Matthew uh, as we start going through the New Testament. But today we're going to go back to this series called The Standard. Now we're going to be in the Sermon on the Mount for weeks, okay? I don't know how many weeks that is. It's just going to be for quite some time because we're going to go very slow through this. But last week, if you remember, we introduced the Sermon on the Mount as we, we looked at God's entire plan from from start to finish in the Scripture, that He has forever intended to call out for Himself a people who were separate 
from the world, even though they are in the world, but not of the world, as the Apostle Paul would say, separate unto himself the children of Israel in the Old Testament, the church in the New Testament. And God has forever uh, had that in his plan. And as the new covenant comes along in the New Testament, Jesus is introduced by Matthew through a genealogy. If you uh, have read Matthew chapter 1, you know that. And then early on as Jesus' ministry begins, he delivers what some have called the manifesto, if you will. Jesus' manifesto was his public declaration of intent on and about his kingdom. Now again, we don't use that word manifesto much today. We use uh, terms like platform or agenda. And the word would, would translate, that would be fine. Jesus' platform is being delivered here in Matthew chapter 5, chapter 6, and chapter 7, or his agenda, if you will. Now a lot of people also have called the, the Sermon on the Mount uh, Jesus' kingdom being presented to us as an upside-down kingdom because so much of what Jesus describes and teaches us in the Sermon on the Mount turns everything on its head. In fact, last week we talked about how sometimes even the Sermon on the Mount can seem, uh, the word that I used was violent, okay, or at, at times impractical. Because we looked a lot last week at the fulfillment of the law and our righteousness being uh, needed to be more than that of the Pharisees. And oftentimes we look at the Sermon on the Mount and it's just not practical in our mind. Okay, But this is Jesus' kingdom and as he presents it, he's bringing something completely brand new to those who would call themselves his followers. So if you have Matthew in front of you, you may remember that Jesus' ministry as Matthew begins to describe it for us, begins in chapter 4, and really beginning in verse 23 through verse 25 at the end, we see the initial beginnings of Jesus' ministry. And as his ministry was beginning on planet Earth, the interest in him was snowballing, all right? I shared with you last week that it was almost like a messianic fever was growing because Israel had long been looking for the Messiah. They were long, had been long looking for that one who was called the Christ, who would be their Messiah. And here comes Jesus, and in Matthew 4, he tells us that he's traveling around all these cities. He's teaching. He's preaching. He's healing every disease, all kinds of diseases, okay? He's healing those who have just literal pain and those who, uh, are, uh, uh, those who are paralyzed and those who suffer from seizures. People are coming to them from everywhere. The crowds are growing and they are gathering and the news of Jesus is spreading greatly at this time. And it's at this point that Jesus finds a strategic location as all these crowds are with him and his initial disciples are close to him, and he finds this strategic location on the side of a mountain, and in verses 1 and 2 that we looked at last week, it says that he sits down, if you will, and begins to teach them. Now, I shared with you last week again that in this day and age, as a rabbi would have his disciples follow him and listen to his teaching, if that rabbi was just walking along the way, or just spending regular time with his disciples, and they're just walking and talking. It's a teaching that would be considered informal or unofficial. It would still be a teaching, but it would not be something that was considered official. But when a rabbi would sit down, he would take at that point in time the official position of what we would call formal teaching, an official type of teaching. And so Jesus assumes the position, if you will, of a formal rabbi at this point, and he begins to talk to his disciples and the crowds about what the kingdom of heaven is going to be like. Now, as he does, and you look at Matthew chapter 5, many of you may know this, some of you may not, that he begins in verses 3 through verse 12 with eight what we call Beatitudes really nine different statements, and the last two are really on the same one, but he covers eight different beatitudes. Nine times he uses the word blessed, 
or blessed is those, are those. If you look at verse number 3, which is ours today, it says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And then he goes on in all the verses to follow. He says, Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Blessed are the merciful. Blessed are the pure in heart. Blessed are the peacemakers. And then twice he goes over this, Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness. And then in verse 11 he says, Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Nine times he uses this word blessed. Blessed are those. And so immediately... You need to understand this. This is, this is huge to understanding the Sermon on the Mount, I believe. Because as Jesus is delivering His manifesto, His, his um, agenda, if you will, for those who would follow Him for His kingdom, He begins His message with this thought of, you can be blessed. God wants you to be blessed. God is after your happiness. Okay, I'll come back to that in a moment. God wants you to know that you can experience joy in His kingdom. This is very important. As you think about all the things that Jesus is going to talk about and how difficult it is to consider some of the things that He he describes and He teaches us about, that first and foremost He begins with this, I want you to know that in my kingdom you can and you will be blessed. Now, what does this word blessed mean? Or blessed, blessed are those who are poor in spirit. What does it mean to be blessed? It has nothing to do, first of all, with temporary things. If I am happy, okay, because of a baseball score or a football score or something going on in life, that is a temporary thing because next week it may not be the same. Right? You can win one week and lose the next week, and your happiness will fluctuate based on the circumstances. But what Jesus is talking about here when he talks about this word blessed, he's talking about this inward centeredness, if you will, that is not affected by outside circumstances. It is not affected by those things that are around us. It is it is settled inside of me, and they sound paradoxical in nature. Blessed are the poor in spirit. And then he follows that up with the reward by saying, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now in every one of these, he is describing in these eight things, okay, he is describing one person, all right? You don't get to pick and choose between the Beatitudes and say, well, I'm a peacemaker, but I just, I'm not poor in spirit. Or I don't mind being persecuted as long as I don't have to hunger and thirst for righteousness. These eight things describe one person. Just like if you go to Galatians chapter 5 and you read about the fruit of the Spirit, all of the fruit of the Spirit are to be encompassed in the Christian's life. Just as all of these eight Beatitudes are to be encompassed in your life as a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. And in these eight things... Jesus describes things that are completely different than the way we have thought in the world before. These things are going to have us think completely different about the kingdom that Jesus is promoting here. They are designed to create a brand new way of living. And they are going to require a completely opposite kind of pursuit in my life if I want to be a part of the kingdom of heaven. But again... Jesus' promise up front is a promise of blessing, is a promise of heavenly joy. It is a promise that uh, Max Lucado calls the sacred delight, if you will. And the ultimate meaning, if you're ready to write this down, I don't know that you take notes or not, and if you didn't pick up a piece of paper on the outside that's used for all of our discipleship groups, I'm sorry we didn't let you know about that, but it has all this on there. The word blessed simply means this. Are you ready? It is the approval of God. The word blessed, when we read the scripture where it says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed simply means the approval of God. In other words, it is God's positive judgment of you. 
It is God's positive assessment of who you are. So blessed are the poor in spirit means that the poor in spirit have the approval of God on their life. You are approved by me, is what Jesus says. Or in other words, uh, in other places in the scripture, it could sound like this. Well done, good and faithful servant. And so the word blessed means that to have, again, the approval of God. This is so much more than just Jesus' wish that you would be happy. This is so much more than just Jesus saying to you, like we say sometimes today, I hope you have a blessed day. This is about the ultimate acceptance of God Himself as the King of the kingdom, that His approval is on your life. Now, now is a good time for me to ask you this question. And if you take notes, you might want to write this down just so that you can see it. You may have a photographic memory and you don't need to do that and you can remember it. But here's my question for you to ask yourself. Are you ready? And that is this. Do I desire God's approval more than anyone else's? Do I desire the approval of God more than anything else in life? more than anyone else's approval in life. Seriously. I mean, this is a serious question. This is not a rhetorical question. And I know we're in church, and I know that we all know, because we're all in church, what the right answer is supposed to be. Correct? Well, I mean, we all know that. But I want you to ask yourself this question very seriously in your spirit as you hear this word today, and that is this, do I desire God's approval more than Mike's? Does Mike, deserve, does Mike uh, desire God's approval more than Stephen's? Do I desire God's approval more than yours as a church? Do you desire God's approval more than your friends, more than your family, more than one another? It is a very serious question because if God's approval is your greatest desire, if it is, then these eight blessed statements found in the Beatitudes that are called, uh, again, blessed are you, they will penetrate your heart in, a, in the deepest of ways and they will change your life. Now, one of the great things about Jesus' teaching here is this. As a teacher, he is giving us all the answers to all of the test questions up front. Have you ever had a teacher like that? I always loved those teachers. Because I knew then, okay, if I can know what the answers are on the test before the test is given, I'll have a better chance at passing the test. Here's what you need to know. God is for you today. God is absolutely for you. He desires to approve of you. Again, the word blessed means the approval of God is on your life. His desire is for you to be approved by Him. His desire is for you to be blessed by Him. His desire is to give you peace, to give you joy, to fill you with contentment. His desire is to welcome you into His kingdom. His desire is not to make it hidden or to make it hard. He wants to make it simple. And that's why he says to you today, blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who have this poverty of spirit because theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So he gives you the answers to the test questions. Blessed are those who are poor in spirit. Now, let's define what this word poor means. First of all, let's talk about what the word poor is not, okay? The word poor is not something, and that will help us define it, okay? And that is this. Being poor in spirit is not this conviction that you walk around with that you have no value. That is not what poor in spirit means. Being poor in spirit is not this absence of self-worth. Being poor in spirit is not this self-deprecation that says, well, I'm nothing, or I'm nobody, or I'm worth nothing. That is not what poor in spirit means. If you want to know what your value is to the Lord Jesus Christ, if you want to know what you, what you are worth to God, that was settled long ago on the cross where He died for you. Here's my other question. Who else has died for you? Nobody else has died for you. 
No one else has given their life for you, but God has. That's how much you are worth to Him. He has established forever and eternity how important you are to Him. So being poor in spirit is not about the self-deprecating, oh, I'm just not worth anything. I'm just trash. I'm nobody's anything. That is not what this means. So what does the word poor mean? There's two meanings of the word poor in the New Testament, okay? There are two words that are used. I'm not going to go through all the Greek with you. I'm just going to tell you what they mean because nobody cares about Greek today. We don't talk that language, all right? But the first word for poor in the New Testament means this. It means ordinary poor. Ordinary poor. And the ordinary poor person was somebody who had something, just not that much of it. All right? In other words, they had meager resources, but what they had was resources. They might have been meager, they may have been small in amount and poor, but they had some. Let me give you an example. If you have your Bible, go to, to Luke chapter 21. Go to your right, go to Luke chapter 21, and we'll give an example about what meager resources look like in ordinary poor. All right? In Luke chapter 21, beginning in verse 1, we read about the widow's might, all right? And here it is. Jesus says in verse 21, As he looked up, Jesus saw the rich putting their gifts into the, tre the temple treasury. He also saw a poor, there it is, the common poor widow put in two very small copper coins. I tell you the truth, he said, this poor widow has put in more than all the others. All these people gave their gifts out of their wealth, but she gave out of her poverty. She put in all she had to live on. She put some in the plate. Why? Because she had some. All right? She was poor, and she gave up some significance in her living in order to give to God. Now, I witnessed this in person when we were, 16 of us, went to Uganda, Africa. Lori and I were two of those 16. I was with one of my buddies one day, and we were in one of these villages in Uganda, Africa. And as we had shared the gospel that day, uh, there were many folks who responded and gave their life to Christ and, and accepted the good news. They, we were able to give them Bibles in the language of Lugandan, and they loved all that. And as we were getting ready to leave, one of the ladies in the village looked at our interpreter and in their language said, please wait. And we did, and she ran off. And when she came back, she had two eggs in her hand. And through interpretation, our interpreter, our interpreter let us know that this was her gift to us for bringing her good news, for sharing the gospel with her, letting her know how she could know God, how she could have sin forgiven. And I had an egg in my hand, and my buddy Travis had an egg in his hand. Now, I got to tell you, I'm woefully American. Okay, I, I am who I am. So I'm just going to be honest at this point, if that's okay with y'all. I kind of had one of those attitudes and went, okay. Are y'all with me? Y'all have attitudes like that? Or am I the only one in the room? Okay. Anyway, and we walked off, and our interpreter stopped us and said, I want you to know something. And we're like, what is it? He said, she more than likely sacrificed that as the full meal for even her children, for you. And he said, the best thing you can do is to take that home tonight and fry it up and eat it if you want to honor her gift. The rest of that day, I walked around like this. I said, okay, I know what I got now. <laughs> I got a sacrificial gift given to me out of thanks. But guess what? She still had in order to give. So there's an ordinary poor here, and I think y'all understand that y'all know what I'm talking about. There's another word for poor, and it is the one that Jesus uses in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 3, and it's this word that can be literally translated as beggarly poor. Beggarly poor. In other words, it is somebody who has absolutely and completely nothing. They are completely, 
fully, 100% dependent on others for any sustenance that they can get. They have absolutely no means of self-support, zero resources, totally destitute. Nothing, not one egg to give, not one coin to contribute, absolutely nothing. It is a beggarly, poor kind of poverty. It's a word that, that describes, I want you to picture a beggar in your mind at this point now. A beggar who shrinks away, cowers away, and cringes at the fact that they have to beg in order to have anything. Let me see if I can't illustrate it with my coffee cup, okay? If you can imagine a man being beggarly poor, the way Jesus is describing this kind of poverty, in his day, you would be witnessing a man who is cringing, cowering, and cringing out of humility that they have absolutely nothing. And they might find themselves a little corner in public where somebody could see them and they with maybe a cup or maybe just their hand, honestly, would just shrink and cower and cringe and with one hand hold out and hope for anything because, again, they have nothing. And with the other hand, they would hide their face. Why? Because they were humiliated. In their humility, they had nothing and they could only hope that somebody would give them something, anything, anything, because if not, they walk away once again with nothing. And so Jesus says to his disciples and to those who are listening about the kingdom of heaven, he starts, this is the foundation This is where he begins everything about his kingdom. Blessed are those who realize, who know that spiritually speaking, they have nothing to offer me. They have nothing to offer God. It's not that they have a little something. It's not that they're talented and that their talents can improve God's agenda or that they have something in their giftedness that God's like, whoa, I could use that. They have nothing to give and they know it. This kind of spiritual poverty is what Jesus is talking about, that if you want to be a part of the kingdom of heaven, this is where it begins. It is first... And it's just like so many other things in life. If you don't get the first thing right, it doesn't matter which way you go around the bases. If you don't go from home to first, first, then if you want to go from home to second, then it doesn't matter. You have to start right here because the kingdom of heaven begins here. Now, why is that the case? I'm going to give you three reasons, okay? The first two reasons today are very similar, but you know it doesn't matter. I'm going to give you three reasons that spiritual poverty is essential for you to have the kingdom of heaven today. For you to know the kingdom of heaven, to know it today, to know it for all eternity. Number one, spiritual poverty is essential for God's approval. It is essential for the approval of God. Remember, blessed means having the approval of God. So let's review. Number one, you must recognize. You have to recognize today, spiritually speaking, that as you come to God, you are totally destitute. You are completely dependent on the work of God for you because you have nothing to bring to the table. You have nothing to offer Him. There is nothing that is impressive in me at all that as I come to the table to meet with God about His kingdom that He goes, oh wow, Mike, you've got this. I didn't know that. Then that's, that's a bonus point for you. No, I have nothing to bring. The kingdom of heaven, the reason this is so important, has no room whatsoever for pride. The kingdom of heaven has no room, period, for the smallest amount of pride. We must come to God knowing, knowing that I am empty-handed, that God, if you don't give me anything, 
then I walk away with nothing because I bring nothing to you. I bring nothing on my behalf. And then if I, if I, don't, if I walk away empty, God, it's because you don't give me anything. I have no resources. I have no hope, nothing to offer, nothing in my self-sufficiency. Let's look at an example. Go back to the book of Luke one more time. Go back to Luke chapter 18. And oftentimes what we see when Jesus begins to give us a parable is, again, Jesus will put two of the most extreme people on various sides of a parable. So many times that the, the, the Israelites would say, he can't do this. Because oftentimes he does what he's about to do in this parable, and that is he's going to compare a Pharisee, are you ready for this, with a tax collector. All right? In Luke chapter 18, look beginning at verse number 9. There's a key word to me in this verse. It says, To some who were confident of their own righteousness. Now let's just stop right there for a moment. Who would that be? Are you ready for me to answer that? To some who were confident of their own righteousness. I'm about to give you the answer. Are you ready? Are you looking? I would. I don't know that I'm the only one in the room. And if I am, I might need to <laughs> let someone else be your pastor. I don't know. But if you want to know who is confident in their own self-righteousness, I'm willing to bet you that you don't have to look any further than right where you are. Right where I am. To some who are confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everybody else. Have you ever looked down on somebody else? Jesus told them this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray. One, a Pharisee, and the other, a tax collector. The Pharisee stood up and prayed about himself. God, I thank you that I am not like other men, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I wonder if he pointed like that. Even like this guy over here, this tax collector. And then he goes on to say, I fast twice a week. I give a tenth of all I get. He begins to give his spiritual resume in prayer to God as if it matters. But the tax collector, verse 13, stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but he beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I tell you, Jesus is speaking here, that this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. That blew Israel, the, 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 it blew their culture's mind to hear that Jesus would say that this tax collector went home justified, not the Pharisee. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Humility is the foundation for everything in the kingdom of heaven. This is why Jesus starts, Blessed are the poor in spirit. Approval begins with those who realize they are beggarly poor in their spirit because they have no pride in them whatsoever. They come to God completely humbled. Pride has no part. The smallest amount of pride has no part in the kingdom of God. It's been said by others that the door to the kingdom of heaven is low. The door to the kingdom of heaven is low. Any, any of you ever been in one of those old-fashioned... Chick-fil-A dwarf houses that I... Have y'all ever been in one of those, anybody? Chick-fil-A, I think they're getting rid of all these what they call dwarf houses because uh, they're rebuilding things now, okay? But they used to have these dwarf houses that had this little door. If you've ever been in it, you know what I'm talking about. And it had a dwarf-sized door. Kids loved to go through them, okay? Because it was a real door. But you had other doors over there for adults. But oftentimes these kids would not be satisfied if they had their parents or their grandparents with them. They'd be like, come through the door with me. So what did you have to do if you were an adult? They'd be like, oh, I can't. You know, you got to go through this. You had to lower yourself to go through. That's the door to heaven. The door to heaven is humility. The door to the kingdom of heaven 
It's humbling yourself, realizing you have nothing that you can give. You cannot be filled until you have been emptied. You cannot be made worthy until you realize, spiritually speaking, your complete unworthiness. You cannot live until you admit that you are dead spiritually. And this is what Jesus is saying. This is why spiritual poverty is essential for the approval of God. Now the second thing I would tell you is this, that this and that is spiritual poverty is essential for salvation. Now I know I've already been saying that, so to speak, but why is spiritual poverty necessary and essential for salvation? It's because of this. The kingdom of heaven is not birthed in human or personal achievement. There's nothing you can do. There's no good work, again, that wows God and make Him go, whoa, look at my go. Nothing in me can do that. The kingdom of heaven is not birthed in any personal achievement. Any work that I do, it's not good enough to get me into heaven. I must realize again that I am beggarly poor. This is why Jesus said in Luke 19, 10, For the Son of Man came to seek and to save that which was what? Lost. If you're lost, you can't find your way out. I've been on a wilderness hike and camp for several days before, and we're on, when we gather together every night, the, the leader would say to us that before the next day, depending on how many miles we're hiking, he said, if you get lost, sit down. Because if you get lost and you begin to try to find your way out with your own achievement, you're going to get what? More lost. He says, and if you're lost and I have to come find you, I don't want to go looking any farther than I have to. He said, so sit yourself down because if you're lost, there's nothing that you can do about it. You have to understand these things. Again, there's no saving resource in yourself. There's no spiritual merit impressive enough to earn God's favor or reward from Him. And when all of our pride is gone, even the smallest amount, empty-handed with no resource, then he says, that's when the kingdom of heaven is yours. Now let me mention something to you about our current day today and the things that I've been saying so far, and I'm not yet done either. We don't talk like this anymore. Are you ready? I'm about to pick on me. Preachers don't preach like this anymore. You know why? People leave. People leave. And you know what they take when they leave? They take their checkbook with them. And when they take their checkbook with them, guess what's threatened? My ability to get a paycheck. And so pastors don't preach this way anymore because they want a paycheck, right? We don't talk like this anymore. We don't share the gospel with people this way anymore. Jesus tells us unequivocally. He, he's got a crowd around Him. I mean, there's a buzz around Him. And He says, you must be poverty stricken spiritually and realize there's nothing you can do if you want to be a part of my kingdom. And the only way for Christ, listen to this, the only way for Christ to become dear to you is for you to come totally to the end of yourself and realize that He has done everything for you. That's when Jesus Christ is dear to you. Dear to you. This is why churches don't have a Christ in them that is dear to them because we are filled so many places across our country, across our land, across the globe with unsaved, Americanized Christians because Jesus is not dear to us. Why? Because there's something in there that we think is good about ourselves. Jesus is not dear to the church anymore. He's not dear to pastors anymore. He's not dear to any of us as long as we think there's something in us that can give God something to, to improve His cause. There's nothing I can do to improve His cause. He is God. And when pride abounds, even that much, even that much pride abounds in me, guess what? I am not beggarly poor, and I expect God to recognize something in me, and He's like, what? I am God and you are not, Mike. 
We don't talk like this anymore. This is why I said last week that oftentimes the Sermon on the Mount sounds and feels harsh. Sometimes it sounds and feels violent, demanding. Yet you got to remember, this is why I said to this to you up front, you got to remember that Jesus presents us these beatitudes, starting with blessed are the poor in spirit. He presents these to us in a way for us to know, you can be approved by me. I want you to be approved by me. You can be accepted. You can be saved. You can be born again. You can be a part of the kingdom as long as you come properly. But so little emphasis is put on this today. Why? Because none of us in this room enjoy emptying ourselves. Now maybe you do. Help me out if you do. But in my flesh, in my flesh, who I am, I don't enjoy emptying myself. I don't enjoy sacrificing all the time. I don't enjoy carrying my cross and dying daily to myself. I like to live unto myself. Am I the only one? Because my flesh cries out to be uh, enjoyed, the, all the things I want to do and all the things I want to be. It's the struggle that we have. But we just don't talk about these things anymore. There's no beggarly poor in us. We come into churches, pastors included, puffed up, standing tall, as if God's impressed with my presence here and impressed with the fact that I can speak and carry on for 30, 40, or more minutes on a Sunday. Ephesians 2.8 tells us, it is by grace you've been, been saved through what? Faith. The posture of faith is poverty in spirit. That's the posture of faith. If you want to know what faith looks like, it is beggarly poor in its look. Spiritual poverty is essential for the approval of God. It is essential for salvation. And then are you ready for this? Number three, spiritual poverty is essential for spiritual growth, okay? It is essential for us to grow as Christians to maintain this poverty of spirit. If you are a Christian today, if you call yourself a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ, you will never outgrow, you should never outgrow the first in this list, and that is being poor in spirit. A humble recognition of the fact that God has done and still does everything for you, again, is the uh, foundation not only of your salvation, but of your ability to grow in Christ. Just as you cannot come to Christ apart from poverty of spirit, you will not grow in Christ if you don't live in a poverty of spirit. Here's what I'm saying to you, and that is a perpetual, ongoing awareness of your spiritual poverty opens you up to continually receive the approval of God, to continue to receive the blessings of God. This is why you should never outgrow this. You should always know that God's blessings come to those who humble themselves before Him and constantly realize, God, apart from you, I can achieve nothing. I'll become nothing. In fact, the more spiritually mature you become, the more profound your sense of spiritual poverty will become in your life. Now again, I said it a moment ago, Jesus will never become dear to you. He will never stay dear to you unless you remain poor in spirit. I don't know what happens oftentimes. Listen, it happens to pastors again, and you've seen some of it because you've seen high-profile cases of it, of the time where men who occupy a position of pastor fall, fall morally, fall terribly, okay? They're not the only ones that can. It, it happens in, in, in the life of the church everywhere, not just in pastors, but something happens somewhere down the line and pride kicks back in. Over the years when we see the, the famous stories, if you will, of televangelists who have fallen, I've thought to myself a couple things. Number one, I'd be willing to bet they didn't start out that way. I'd be willing to bet they started out as humble as they could, filled with the Spirit of God, 
filled with their own poverty of spirit in themselves, following God in a way that they just, they they were on their knees, on their face before God. God poured into them. God blessed them. And something happened along the way. And pride kicked in. Kind of like Lucifer. Maybe they began to look at themselves and go, huh, man, maybe I am something. You know? Something happens to churches in that way too, not just pastors. And pride begins to kick in and we begin to think things like this. Maybe, just maybe, I've arrived. Maybe I'm there. There's an example of this in the Scripture. I believe we need to be aware of it in America today because as Jesus delivered seven messages... To the churches in Revelation 2 and Revelation 3. He delivered one through John to a church in Laodicea. And that's where we are as America today. Go to Revelation chapter 3 if you will. Revelation chapter 3 beginning in verse 14. The scripture tells us this. To the angel of the church in Laodicea write... These are the the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation. And then this is what Jesus tells this church. He says, I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish, he says, you were either one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I am about to spit you out of my mouth. Then notice verse 17. You say, who says? The church says. You say, I am rich. I have acquired wealth. I do not need a thing. But then Jesus' assessment, His approval or lack of says this. But you do not realize you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. You are wretched, He calls them. Jesus looks at His church And he says, you're wretched, you're pitiful, you're poor, you're blind, and you are naked. He says, I wish you were with one or the other. Laodicea, I think I've taught you all this before uh, some time ago. Laodicea had no water supply. This was a place that had no water supply to themselves. They had to pipe in any water that came to them. So from Colossae, they would pipe in those nice... Uh, freezing cold spring water for them to drink, right? And so they built all these aqueducts to, to pipe in the water to Laodicea from Colossae. Hierapolis up here had these wonderful hot water springs, great for bathing and great for medicinal purposes. And so they built all these aqueducts to bring that water to Laodicea. And y'all know what happened. That after miles of aqueducts, that those cold freezing waters, that great drinking water from Colossae that came to Laodicea, by the time it got there, what had happened to that water? It had warmed up just enough to be, okay, lukewarm. Lukewarm. Not that ice cold water that you need when you're out cutting the grass in July and August. And then same thing with Hierapolis. See, here here comes this hot spring water that's great for medicinal purposes, great for bathing. It's coming down in these aqueducts, and by the time it arrives at Laodicea, what's it done? It's cooled down just enough to be lukewarm and not good for anything once again. And so Jesus is talking to this church in terms that they understood in terms that they were able to say, yeah, I get that picture, I understand the illustration. He says, I wish you were cold, I wish you were hot, I wish you were accomplishing this purpose or that purpose, but because you're neither one, it's just not any good. It's just not worth it. He says, you say that you're rich. You say you've acquired wealth. You say, I don't need anything. But I say to you, Jesus says, that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. I'm afraid the church in America continues to say, God, we're rich. We've acquired wealth. We don't need anything. The way a lot of churches run because of programs, God's not even needed anymore. God's not needed in the church. The Holy Spirit's not required the way we do a lot of things. And God's like, okay, I'll let you have it your way because you've acquired everything you want. You've got everything you feel like you need. But he says to us, oh no, you're wretched. We don't want to hear words like that, do we? 
But when we let pride kick in and we don't remain poor in spirit, then that's what happens to us. We begin to take a look at ourselves somehow and say, wait a minute, I've arrived. Wait a minute, we have. Wait a minute, I don't have to depend on God any longer. We're puffed up in knowledge. We're puffed up in resources. We're puffed up in self. And Jesus says we're good for nothing. And that's why the standard, the standard, the manifesto of Jesus of the kingdom of heaven sounds, feels, appears to be harsh at times. It feels like it's a little violent for our taste because we like respectable church. And it sounds unreasonable to us. You mean to tell me my righteousness has to exceed that of the Pharisees? What? I can't achieve that. Is what everybody was hearing. Yet he's telling us, my approval, my approval is for the one. My approval is for the group. My approval is for the ones who come to me and they realize that I'm everything for them. That you have nothing to bring. And when you come to me in that kind of humility, and when you come to me in that kind of recognition, then I can do something with you. And we can take this kingdom of heaven, and we can charge the world with it, and we can see what happens when the Bible, when He says to us that the gates of hell cannot prevail against the church. It's not that the church is some defensive little weak thing that, 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 that doesn't know what to do. He's describing a church that is going forward. And the gates of hell can't withstand it because the gates of hell are on the defense then. Oh, if we just believe that God is ready to do everything through us, if we'll allow Him to. His approval, His approval awaits, awaits you recognizing that it's about Him in every way, shape, form, or fashion. To know Him, that you have nothing to give, and that you'll have nothing to bring later. His approval is awaiting. His salvation is ready to be given to the one who is beggarly poor. And I believe, as we talk so much in the churches today about revival, revival awaits the church that says to God, we've become this, but we're ready to come back. We're ready to humble ourselves. We are ready to do things your way. Why? Because the kingdom of heaven is the reward. The kingdom of heaven belongs to those who are beggarly poor. And the kingdom of heaven can be known right now. Jesus said eternal life is this, that they may know you, the one true God. We can know the kingdom of heaven as best we can on this side because that's what eternal life is. Eternal life is knowing the one true God. It's not just something later, even though that's coming, it's something that begins right now. So let me ask you this question. How did you come to Christ? How did you come to Christ? This is important. Did you come to Christ because it was a good idea? Did you come to Christ because... It's the right thing to do in a community to be a part of a church. Did you come to Christ because there was a pretty girl across the room and you wanted to meet her? <laughs> I, I don't know. Why'd you, come to, why'd you come to Christ? Why'd you come to church? How did you come? Here's why I'm asking. If you came to Christ in any other way other than beggarly poor you didn't come the right way you did not humble yourself before a holy God realizing that only he could save you no resources on your own if you came to God in any other way my job is not to have you question things but my job is just to preach the word of God if you came to God in any other way I would call you then today an American Christianized person, a church person, but possibly not born again, not saved. He demands total humility, no pride whatsoever. Spiritual poverty is essential for the approval of God. It is essential for your salvation. It is essential for us as a church 
to move forward and grow in any way, shape, form, or fashion. To be impoverished in spirit. Let's pray. With your heads bowed and eyes closed, I just want to ask you again, if you came to, to Christ in any other way or for any other reason, let me encourage you today to just be bold. Be bold and say, you know what? I, I, I'm coming to Christ today finally. Finally, in the way that He has told me that I can have the kingdom of heaven. And that is realizing I have nothing to bring, nothing to offer, nothing. And I'm going to let Him fill my cup. I'm going to let Him give me salvation. I'm going to let Him forgive me of my sin. Realizing nothing I do will ever impress Him. Nothing I do can ever gain His favor. Nothing I have. I invite you today to give your life to the Lord Jesus Christ. I invite you today to humble yourself in a way that says, God, I ask you today to save me. I ask you today to forgive me of my sin. I ask you, Lord, to fill me with your life because I have nothing to offer because you are God and I am not. If that is you today, I encourage you, as you pray right now, let it be known to somebody. Let it be known to me. Let it be known to a family member that you're with today. Let it be known to a friend or to one of our church members. Let it be known to them that today you trusted Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sin, realizing that today is the day of salvation for you, that today is the day that you realized that apart from God you had no hope. To the church today, those of you who are already born again, those of you who are already Christians, listen, it's difficult. I'm telling you as my own testimony to you from me, it is hard to not let pride slip in and to take over and to begin to look at yourself or ourselves or our ministries or our resources and say, look at what we have, look what we've acquired, look what we've accumulated, look at what we can do. And dear church, I beg of you today to come before the Lord and say whatever needs to be said in your spirit. and Say, God, I am not going to look any longer at myself or or the giftings that you have given me, the talents that you've blessed me with, as anything other than your gifts and what you've given, Father, to me for your benefit, for your good, for the extension of your kingdom. Dear church, please pray with me that we would be humble before God, asking Him, trusting Him, realizing that apart from Him to give us anything for the days ahead or for anything in our ministry, Lord, we would be lacking without it. Father, I thank you today for the fact that you have given us, as I said a moment ago early on in the message, you've given us the answers up front. You've not hidden yourself at all. You've not played hide and seek in any way. You've told us, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Lord, approval by you awaits us. It is ready to be given to us. It is ready to be showered upon us. If only, if only we'll come to you as you have instructed. Father, I pray that there would be those today online, on YouTube right now, or in this place or across the parking lot that would say to you today, Father, I come to you for the first time poor in spirit, asking you to save me. And Lord, for your church, that we would ask you to come, revive us again, bring us back to the place, Lord, of a total reliance upon you, never again to rely upon ourselves, always grateful for everything you give, but realizing again, Lord, that unless you continue to give to us, we will be without what we need. So Lord, we declare our dependence on you today. And we ask you, Father, to have your way with our lives. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey, a couple of things for you before Stephen comes up. Um, I had something for Oh, yeah. Um, please, again, pray for J.B. Shelley in the hospital. Um, hopefully more information will go out soon. 
And again, if you're in his group and you want to come here tonight, please feel free to uh, come into the sanctuary. If you're not a part of a group, uh, you can find one of us and find out how to become a part of one of our discipleship groups. All right? Come ahead, Stephen. And here this morning. Um, I, I want to mention a, a couple visiting with us this morning. Great to have Brother John and Miss Kara Webb here with us this morning. Um, <laughs> I, I mentioned men quite often that was uh, involved in my life as I was growing up, and Brother John is one of them. I mentioned Mr. Earl McBride from time to time, uh, Mr. Robert Watford. They taught me in Sunday school. I remember Brother John teaching training union and then being involved, and just appreciate your faithfulness and uh, for your investment, even in my own life. So glad y'all here today. A um, few, few announcements here. One, before I... If there's any decision anybody needs to make, anything the pastor needs to know about, if you'd like prayer or anything, don't forget we have these cards down here. It's a um, pen available and a little notepad that um, William and them hadn't cut over all of them yet. <laughs> but uh, but f fill that out and, and, and hand it to him or get it in the basket out there some way. If there's any decision you need to make, any question you have uh, or anything, um, tomorrow night, uh, Parkview Baptist Church is playing their first softball game of the scheduled season. So if you'd like to come out and, uh, and uh, support them, uh, laugh at them, there's, there's some out there because they're generally good ball players, and there's some out there for comedy. And you'll be able to recognize the two. But that's tomorrow night at 6 o'clock. And as Jamie would tell you, come support the Parkview Baptist Golden Kittens. <laughs> so anyway, that starts at six o'clock. Um, there's going to be this week's going to be a deacons meeting on Tuesday night. Tuesday night at six o'clock. We need the what deacons can come to the church. We'd like to invite you here to the church for a meeting. If you can't come, uh, I, I think we're going to set up a Zoom. So if you're absent, you can also be involved in the meeting through Zoom of some sort. Um, prayer groups uh, for Sunday morning worship. I'm still asking people to be involved in prayer on Sunday morning. Uh, this is where somebody's praying during the service each Sunday, and we really need to get that started, but uh, I just don't have a long list yet. We're going to teach you how to do that or go over how to do that. So anybody that would be in, like to be involved in that ministry, if you'll just see me, give me your name. It can be you and your spouse, you and someone else, anybody. If anybody's involved in that or wants to be involved with that, please let me know. Uh, young people, the night of worship is September the 23rd, beginning at 6 o'clock. The young people are going to start back meeting together. Uh, of course, they've been meeting in some homes, doing some different things, but they're going to begin meeting back in the church. That begins, and this is a citywide event, on September 23rd at 6 o'clock, and then from the 30th on, the young people will begin back meeting. Um, don't forget your discipleship group meeting tonight, and Brother Mike mentioned this. If you're not in a group... Hey, come to the church. If you get to hearing about groups, uh, what they're eating and what they're doing and all that kind of stuff, and it sounds really fun, and you're not involved with one, I'm sure you can speak to him or someone on Sunday night and try to get into one. But that's a, a, a great thing going on, so I encourage you to be involved. Now, we have a couple of... Uh, Brooke Morris, um, there's going to be a drive-by bridal shower in honor of Brooke Morris, and this is on September the 27th on a Sunday from 2 to 4. And I guess you all know by now how those drive-bys work. Also, Miss Ashley Brown and Miss Benjamin Emrick are getting married, and they would like to invite you to their wedding, which is going to be here at Parkview Baptist Church on October the 3rd. It's at 4 o'clock in the afternoon, and they request your presence. The reception is going to be in the James S. Clark Center. All right, anything I missed? Any announcements that I need to make that I didn't make? Okay, as we dismiss again, thank you so much for, for doing a good job of getting on out of here and talking uh, out in the parking lot. Remember, as more and more people are coming back, our sanctuary is getting a little more crowded. Be mindful of that. Uh, you know, kind of shift all the way in or, or, you know, space yourself accordingly. And let's try to get as many people in here as we can. Uh, again, the balcony out the back door, this side out this door, this side out this door, and this side door.
don't exactly have to be like that, but if most people do, we'll get out in a pretty fair fashion. So, all right, let's pray and we'll be dismissed. Lord, thank you so much for the day. Lord, thank you for our time here in worship. Thank you for reminding us uh, to be poor in spirit. Lord, I pray that uh, I pray that each of us are challenged by that today. And Lord, uh, help us to study and and. And, Lord, to find out just what you need to show us in your word. Help us in our groups tonight. Uh, Lord, just go with us throughout today and help us be mindful of others and be obedient to you. In Jesus' name, amen.